You know, jet propulsion has been around since the 1940s, and for high speeds, you can't beat it, but it's also complex. It tends to use large rotating assemblies, as we see in every turbojet and turbofan. But there is a way to get very high-speed jet propulsion with no moving parts, and they're called ramjets. They've been around for a long time, but to make a practical ramjet, which is lightweight, durable, and powerful, that's a very difficult engineering challenge. I'm with Jay Blake. He's Applications Development Engineer for Velo 3D. And Jay, we're standing beside a model of an engine you've designed for a ramjet. Tell me about it. Yeah, so this was a design that I came up with when I was in undergrad at Purdue University studying aeronautics and astronautics. A uh, professor essentially challenged me to alter an existing engine cycle to gain performance and some sort of efficiency. So I had an idea to alter your standard ramjet architecture and basically utilize this volume of the inlet spike as a heat exchanger. So what you're doing is uh, you're sending fuel up to the tip of the spike and you're essentially evacuating a lot of that aerodynamic heating that's happening as the oblique shock waves are set off. And you're rerouting that heated fuel and you're injecting it perpendicularly into the incoming airflow. Now, I notice, of course, you've, you've the center body has perforations on it. Of course, automatically we're thinking of, of boundary layer control. We're thinking of yeah. bleed air. Tell me how that works. Yeah, so the point or the kind of main um, goal of the ramjet inlet is to diffuse the incoming oblique shock waves to a subsonic speed, right? You need to disperse that kinetic energy and slow down to a, a subsonic speed so that you can effectively combust fuel uh, in the combustion region of the engine. So what I thought to do is as this oblique shock wave is set off by the tip of the inlet spike, it uh, deflects off of these walls. And so I thought to basically place a perforation Right, so you have a perforated array on this inner wall, which acts as a boundary layer bleed. So it, you're more effectively pulling in that incoming air and reducing that kinetic energy uh, to, you know, once again, decelerate that airflow to a subsonic speed where you can effectively combust it. What is interesting about this particular model, I thought to take that air that's being pulled in by the bleed and it is rerouted down and then is eventually injected into the wake of the flame holder. And so there's a lot of data that NASA actually published years ago, uh, which suggests that as you inject air into the wake of the flame holder, you're reducing parasitic drag on the engine, but you're also getting uh, an increase in combustion efficiency as well. So, so seriously, so you're backfilling that low pressure zone and you're getting the benefit there, but also increasing combustion efficiency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, very kind of interesting design, um, and one thing to note is with traditional manufacturing methods, this would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to manufacture, um, especially with you know, all of the holes in the perforated arrays that you see here in the center wall, and especially in the flame holder. With traditional manufacturing methods, you know, if you had some sort of inconsistency or discrepancy in those holes or perforations, you would ex experience some sort of thermoacoustic instability in the combustion or the airflow, uh, which would obviously be some sort of performance hit or you know, the engine wouldn't function as intended. So with Metal 3D printing, we're able to print all of these features so consistently globally around the part, uh, which really does reduce a lot of that potential for thermoacoustic instability, like I mentioned. Now you touched on Max's question, which is uh, resonance is a factor when you're designing for, for supersonic. You're, you're managing shock waves on, on one part of the engine, slowing that, that mass flow down to subsonic velocities in another. Yep. We know that historically that, that ramjet engines that were designed before the ability to use this technology often had unknown, untoward resonance effects. So you have pilots reporting strange howling noises, yep. odd metal fatigue effects, uh, a premature failure of components down here. So yep. Does this technology, this ability to produce this complexity, let you like, kind of address those issues? Yeah, it really does. Um, and you know, one kind of way that we've addressed this uh, through a partnership with Lyft, which is a manufacturing initiative that was put on to rapidly prototype uh, additively manufactured systems like this uh, in conjunction with Lockheed Martin, they saw this part and they said, we would love to vibrationally load this and kind of assess the results of that. So uh, through funding provided by them, they printed these you know, full meter articles and then went ahead, vibrationally loaded them, uh, did a frequency response and a spectral analysis to assess the fidelity of the manufacturing process and the metal that comes out of the printer. And you know, 
got phenomenal results. Uh, it was a, a great study, and uh, the project was a great success. So. Yeah, the, the shape, of course, the center body shape is complex. It has to be. Uh, is in terms of the resonance effects there, is it? Do you have to tune masses inside here to dampen resonance, or can you sort of engineer around that? Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, kind of a way that you would iterate through the design process uh, is you know going through that vibrational loading, that frequency response, and you know assessing kind of the weak points in the the problem areas, and then you know you would obviously add some sort of baffling uh, or you know, some sort of uh, grid structure to essentially uh, distribute that vibrational load, um, you know, to prevent some sort of catastrophic failure as a result of, of the, the airflow. Now you're using regenerative cooling uh, in this application, and uh, of course, there are no ceramics in this, no cermats, no sort of high, super high temperature materials. Is this made of Inconel? Is this made of exotic high temperature super alloy? Yeah, yeah so we printed this in Inconel 718, all as one solid piece, uh, which is you know, another great thing, right? If you were to try to attempt to manufacture this traditionally, if you could, uh, it would be hundreds of parts that you know, you'd either have to weld together, or braze together, obviously hundreds of potential failure points, um, so we printed this all in one piece uh, without support material. So everything that you see here, there was no support material added, which is a huge uh, benefit and you know, kind of something that is very unique to Velo3D's technology. Um, yeah, in, in, in Canal 718. And how fast would uh, a working version of this engine operate optimally? Yeah. So uh, when I was kind of designing and scaling the inlet, um, I used the kind of oblique uh, shock wave deflection charts to put together a performance map. Um, so based on the scaling of the inlet spike as well as the inlet, um, you know, kind of wall around it, uh, the operating conditions would be anywhere from Mach 2.5 to about Mach 5 is that kind of sweet spot where this would operate. High speed, additively manufactured supersonic ramjets from Velo 3D. At Rapid DCT 2023, the air was electric. The excitement about manufacturing in America is palpable. New technologies, new ways of implementing additive manufacturing, not just for prototyping, but as a true production process, were all over this show floor. The future looks very bright for manufacturing in America based on what we have seen here. Thanks for joining us on the show floor. See you next time. Today's episode is brought to you by Engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on Engineering.com TV today.